Atheist Nomads, episode 95. Heinous Dealings with Hina Databoy. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. As a concerned parent of the uh, free thought community, I want to advise uh, Atheist Nomad listeners that this is an adult show. There will be things discussed, talked about, topics that may be inappropriate for children under the age of 25, 26, 27, 40. (laughs) We are the Atheist Nomads bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. This is episode number 95. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hey there, hi there, ho there, neighbor. And joining us today is Hannah Databoy. Hello. Anna, welcome to Atheist Nomads. It's a pleasure to be here. Yay. Yeah, you've actually <laughs> been on my list of, of people I wanted to get on the show for quite a while, but right when, well, when I was still commonly involved in, in getting guests, uh, you were on pretty much every podcast, and it's like, well, she's already on every podcast. We'll give her a little bit of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, like I, I, I mentioned to you all earlier, I, I, I've only said no to a podcast once, and I had very good and obvious reasons for not doing it. But generally, I say yes. I mean, I've been on a Christian podcast. The, you know, I like With the it. video. Yeah, that was, yeah. That was interesting. The Act 17 guy, David Wood. Yeah, I found out later that he's actually way more of a bigot than he let on. But um, it, it was really fun because all these guys were calling in. And instead of addressing me directly, they would address him. And then I had to say at least three times that, hey, I'm, I'm here too. You can just address your questions to me, directly to me. <laughs> but you're a woman. Yeah, they need, they need to ask the man who I met once to, to facilitate this conversation. <laughs> Oh wow! I'm, I'm clearly really, really incompetent here. Just clearly, yeah, yeah. obviously, God. <laughs> well, what you, am I you, even doing? Not only do you have too many <laughs> X chromosomes, but your skin's not even you know as as light. As, <gasps> I'm not white and delightsome. Oh wait, that's Mormonism, not 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 mainstream <laughs> Christianity. But or Bobby and Jindal. Wait. <laughs> oh, Bobby Jindal. Anyway, and, and you don't talk to imaginary things. friends, so you've got so many things going against you. I'm just wrong in every every possible way. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's, okay, let's... I can tell this this show is going to be horrible already. I can tell it. <laughs> <laughs> the worst. Tune out now. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's start off with you with your uh, your background. Uh huh. What was what was your childhood like? My childhood was equal parts Californian and very very Muslim. Um. So you know. Um. Actually, when I when it was born my parents were not super religious like they didn't eat pork they didn't drink alcohol they didn't gamble well sometimes they gambled a little bit um but my mother wore shorts she didn't wear a headscarf my dad had a mustache and no beard we ate at mcdonald's every sunday we got our happy meal toy toys like it was it, we knew we were different i mean we fasted in ramadan too and we prayed but you know we weren't that different from everybody else we didn't look that different i live in a really diverse area i grew that's where i grew up and um, I had Jewish friends, so not eating pork was not weird. We all were eating the Hebrew national hot dogs and all that. So <laughs> it, it was, you know, it, we were a little different, but no, not that much weirder than everybody else. Um, but then when I was about five, my mom got in with this religious teacher who can really influence her and made her more religious. And my dad uh, kind of followed suit, although not quite as strongly. Um, and then we moved to London for a year when I was like seven. Mm. Um, and the Islam there, oh my gosh, is very different because the immigrant community there is really, a lot of them are, are former refugees um, who sort of use the British colonial system to their advantage where they can more easily immigrate. Whereas, you know, American immigrants, like people who come to America tend to be more educated and stuff like that. And it really shows where 
in England, they all live in one area and you can, the part of London that I lived in, I could go days without seeing a person who wasn't of the same ethnicity as me. Wow. wow. Yeah. And so it was just, it, it was a very different sort of existence. And, uh, yeah, I got really influenced because I was a really literal kid. I also really wanted adults to be pleased with me because, you know, I wasn't particularly cute. I mean, it was kind of cute, but I wasn't that, what? um, like I was a cute kid, but I wasn't that charming. Like I was awkward. I liked to read and I was clumsy and all that. So I just wanted to please adults. So I became religious because the adults around me sort of gave me validation. Um, I also really liked to read and I was at a very high reading level at a very young age. So my mom brought home all these religious books because she was educating herself and I would read them before she had even had a chance to read them because I would just fly right through them. And <laughs> not that I understood all of it, but I understood enough of it. So the England thing didn't work out. We came back after about one year, but it really left a mark on me. And I was just really religious. And I thought that the people around me who were Muslim, who weren't as religious as me, just didn't know. Like, I thought that they were like me where they didn't know that they were supposed to follow all these rules. And so I would tell them about the rules and they hated me for it because they thought I was being a know-it-all and holier than thou. But really, I was just trying to save them from hell. I thought they didn't know. Um, nice. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. That, that I, I had very sincere intentions. I never thought I was better than anybody. I just thought that they didn't know. Um, so yeah, that, that led me to be very unpopular, even though, you know, I went to Islamic schools until I was in eighth grade. So um, I was in religious schools, but because I was too religious, the other students hated me. Plus, I found out <laughs> years later that other parents would use me to scold their children. They think, oh, oh, why can't you be as good as Hina? And I'm like, no wonder everyone fucking hated me. You were that kid? I was that Oh, wow. I didn't know I was that kid, though. Because <laughs> <laughs> my parents always treated me like I, I, I still had room for improvement, you know? Whereas other parents were saying, why can't you be more like Hina? Why can't you just quietly read and be religious? And I'm like, that's not, that's not what I wanted. Um, so they <laughs> You're in eighth grade. Why aren't you a doctor yet? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But, you know, people did have really high hopes for me, like the adults in my life, um, my parents, not just my parents, but, you know, my aunts, uncles, everybody, they they all thought that I was going to, you know, strap my babies to my back after a young marriage and having kids early and just write all these books and make make people convert to Islam and, and stuff. You know, they had hopes for me. Um, I had hopes for myself, not as high as theirs, but I was the golden child. Had I been born a boy, I probably would have stayed in Islam for longer. Um but, you know, the hopes and dreams that they had for me and the ones that I had for myself were really limited because of all the rules in Islam about being a woman. And mm -hmm. what made it worse was that I was a really horny teenager, but I couldn't nice. do anything because I was religious. And so I wanted to get married young so I could get laid. That was sure. really it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As um, one would. Yeah. I, sw I swore when I was a horny teenager that I would get engaged by age 17 and a half and married at 18. Thankfully, that didn't happen. Um, but yeah, I was, I was very devoted, but also really horny and also really intellectually inquisitive. So I used to read a lot. You know, I, I stopped just reading religious books. I would go to my school library and the public library and just take books off shelves just on a whim, um, and take recommendations from the librarians who loved me because I clearly loved reading. So, um, my, my, my world started to expand, you know, beyond religion. Um, the one book that really made an impact on me was, the autobiography of a gay guy. And I don't remember the name of the book. I've been searching for years to see if I can find it. Um, but in it, he describes, you know, having gay feelings from a very young age. And I thought, oh, well, how can that be? Because I was told growing up that the reason why people become gay is because in America, everybody's too promiscuous from a very young age. So they get tired of the opposite sex. Oh, yeah, I can totally see that. Whoa. Yeah, so they, they told me that's why they're gay people in America. And then I read this book, though, and it says the that this guy had had gay feelings from a very young age. And I thought, huh. And then, you know, I was suppressing my own same-sex attractions as well. So that wasn't helping things at all. <laughs> um, and then, <laughs> you know, I, I was... The, the real big blows to my faith were, were when I was in high school and I took a class and I learned about existentialism and that blew my mind. I took the red pill, I guess. Um, <laughs> and then and then I took a class that was all discussion and debate. And keep in mind, 9-11 was my second day of high school. So 9-11 really defined my high school experience, not just because I was a Muslim, but also just, you know, being in the U.S. Um, and and 
being fairly politically involved. Um, so um, by my senior year of high school, when I took this discussion class, 9-11 was still fresh in our minds. And so as the resident Muslim who was a loudmouth, um, that hasn't changed about me. <laughs> they Everybody would ask me questions and they would ask me questions. So I had to go research things. And with these Abrahamic religions, I swear, the more you look at them, the less the less appealing they are. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was basically forced to stare long and hard at my religion. Um, and I ended up losing my faith right towards the end of my first year at, at college. So one totally weird question. Uh, OK, you're saying that you, you, you grew up. You get you, your family, your entire family got quite religious for a, quite a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, but did, I mean, you were wearing normal clothes as a, as a younger kid. When when you, your your family got more into it, did you keep wearing normal normalish clothes, or did you ever have to wear a hijab or anything? Um, I actually, um, so I, I was religious, so um, I knew that I would have to wearing start wearing a headscarf when I hit puberty, um, yeah. which you know for girls obviously is getting your period. And the idea, though, that I would suddenly start wearing a scarf and everybody would know that I'd started my period embarrassed me. <laughs> so I started wearing my headscarf at age 10 because I and I told everybody that I had decided to wear it. So that way I wouldn't have to suddenly start wearing it when I got my period. And then everybody would know that I had my period because nice. being, being an adolescent is, is humiliating. Right. Mm-hmm. Everyone, yeah, totally. You know, um, so. So, yeah, I started wearing it at 10. Um, I wore it off and on from age eight. Like sometimes I would wear it, sometimes I wouldn't. But then at 10, I, I committed full time and in good time too. Cause by the time I was almost 11, I did get my period. So, um, no one had to know who I didn't want to know. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And, so, and, uh, taking that a step further, what do you think about a few of the Muslim, uh, girls that I've heard, like actually shaving their head to get around that? That's weird because had about them and i think it's odd because hijab is not just headscarf it's not just your hair it's your neck it's your ears it's the shape of your body it's the shape of your breasts like you're supposed to cover yourself fully you know wear long loose clothing that doesn't show the shape of your body um it's not just your hair it's not just a hair thing so when they shave their heads i'm like okay but your your neck's still showing your ears are still showing because i was i was a committed proper headscarf wearer you know i wore my head scarfed tightly around my face. Not even a little bit of hair showed. Um, my ears were completely covered. My neck was completely covered. And I draped my scarf over my chest so that you couldn't see anything. You couldn't see any hint of breasts. And even yeah. that, and under that, I was wearing a long, loose top. And I would wear long, loose skirts or really baggy pants. So, you know, I was, I was super, super on top of that stuff. So, And super hot during the summer. Well, I would wear as light as I could get away with. And it wasn't, it wasn't as bad as it would seem. I mean, if, if you're not wearing like denim and stuff, if you're wearing like cotton, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. I mean, granted nowadays, you know, when it's hot, I'm immediately in a sundress and I can't imagine wearing pants. I hate pants. Um, But back then, you know, I, I made, I made it work, I think. All right. Fair enough. I wasn't super (laughs) fashionable though. No way. Um, I, I didn't really care about my clothes because to me, wearing a headscarf meant I shouldn't have to care about how fashionable or pretty I looked. I could focus on everything else in my life. But there are women who wear scarves who are very fashionable these days. You see all these women with, you know, perfect makeup and beautifully wrapped scarves and perfectly matching outfits. And I'm like, well, more power to you. I couldn't be bothered. <laughs> I saw quite a bit of that in Jordan when I was there. Yeah, I'm sure you did. Uh, so which, uh, which country is your, your family from? Originally, we can be traced back to India, but we come by way of a million countries. Um, oh, okay. The more accurate description for us is diasporan Indian, basically Indians who get everywhere for generations and then end up in various places, and that's kind of us. So, so fairly nomadic, also. Yeah, I guess. I mean, right. You're on the perfect show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so, but um. Yeah, that's that's actually part of why my parents, I think, latched onto religion because they didn't have a super strong connection to culture. So they just kind of latched onto religion as culture, essentially. It's definitely a grounding thing. Yeah, especially for immigrants because they come here and they watch the evening news and they hear about pregnant heroin addict teenagers and they freak out and, and try to get their kids to not turn out that way. 
My mom had a friend who worked in an emergency room and she would tell her horror stories all day long. Oh, no. <laughs> she would say, oh, you know, a girl came in and she was pregnant and she was 12. And my mom's like, oh, no, people here, you know, keep our kids at home all the time. <laughs> wow. That sounds awesome. Yeah. So you basically got to not really have a, a really fun childhood. Yeah. I mean, kinda, the, the one kept cloistered away from the. The, fun the, stuff. the thing is, they couldn't stop me from being a nerd. And so <laughs> all those books at the library. And then when we got a computer, my sister thought the Internet was for dweebs. So she didn't want to use the computer. So I had the computer mostly to myself. And, you know, I got onto Star Wars forums of all things. Oh, and yeah. and the Star Wars forums had social threads, too. So I met all these people who were older than me and they were living more normal lives. And, you know. Some of them even flirted with me. They really shouldn't have been. I was 14. They were like 20. What were they doing? Um, <laughs> but, you know, like I, it, it expanded my mind. So even though they kept me at home, you know, even without the Internet, books would have been enough, really. Yeah, but the Internet, boy. The Oh, no, the Internet definitely <laughs> took me to places that I never thought existed <laughs> porn, porn and cat videos um not oh, a lot yeah. of porn really for me I, I i read people's written accounts a lot like i go on on like there's this one um female masturbation website where people would submit their techniques and a lot of them mm. were definitely guys who were pretending like I, ah. you could tell like i'd read it i'm like nope that never happened nobody ever masturbated that way um that, but that sounds them, like an old sorry. that sounds exactly like the old magazine the hustler forums yeah it was like that yeah. but but a few of them rang true, you know, and and right. a few of them were for me. So like there, some of them were real, and um, the and it's funny because because I I got I was reading a lot about kink and stuff, and I really mm -hmm. worried because you know I, I had never even kissed a boy or held hands with a boy, so I was as pure as as can be to use that phrase, even though I hate it pure. Um, and I was actually worried that on my wedding night, my husband wouldn't believe that I was a virgin because I wanted to explore like kink and stuff. Um, nice. So I was worried. I was like, oh, you know, he won't believe me that I'm a virgin, but I seriously am. Like, I just have a really active imagination. A like, pure of body, not of mind. Yeah, that, that's, that was me back then. <laughs> uh, yeah, ditto. Okay. I, I, got rid of, I got rid of all that purity as soon as I had the chance and was an atheist, but you know. High five. Yeah. Digital <laughs> high five. <laughs> oh, speaking right. of that, though, uh, oh, this yes. guy got mad at me on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> it may have been a woman, but I, I feel like people get mad at me on YouTube. You know, um, it was some Muslim and they were claiming that now I do sex and porn videos and I must be making a lot of money. And I'm like, no, I wish, <laughs> you know. But um, it really? was it was my I, I did a talk at, at Sexy Secular Con about um, Islam and sexuality and gender. And I talked about my own experience and things that I found in Islam about sex and gender and things like that. Yeah. And their comment was basically accusing me of doing of making tons of money off sex and porn videos. And not really. No, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> OK, you said not really. So there must be a little bit of money somewhere. Well, well, so well, as we an get a title or two. As an ex-Muslim, you know, people invite me to speak at their conferences and I get, uh, you know, usually travel expenses. Um, so, you know, I do get to have fun because of the ex-Muslim thing. You know, I do get to travel to all these conferences and meet a lot of people and party and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it doesn't pay my bills, not by not by any means. <laughs> so are you getting any of that uh, mad Jewish loot for uh, becoming an ex-Muslim? -ex Funny you'd mention that people people accuse me of that all the time that I'm on the Zionist payroll and you know it, hey 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 Zionist payroll if you're listening to this the check's really late and <laughs> I've been waiting like ten years for it now can can I get it There's people that actually buy into that Oh yeah big time When I was a Muslim I kind of believed that too because I heard of Ayan Hirsi Ali when I was still kind of Muslim and I thought oh she must be paid off or something. Well, in her case, she actually is. Kind, totally, I'm sure. Uh, well, all I, the all I mean, the Jews. She, to, yeah. she 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 gets money from right wing think tanks, but I don't necessarily blame her because she does need a twenty four hour seven security. So oh fucking hey, she does. Yeah. Man. And mm. my I'm I'm just saying. Just a minute ago, I was joking <laughs> that she's getting paid off by the Jews. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I know she really does need security. That's so fucked up. Yeah. 
<sighs> so, uh... We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. Yeah, I guess I guess maybe I could talk a little more about what made me apostate, like officially. Yeah, yeah how sure. did that totally. that that transition happen? Well, um, by the time I graduated high school, I was very conflicted about my faith. I didn't tell anybody because I didn't want to make it real by speaking the words to somebody. So I spent the summer between high school and college mostly watching South Park and thinking really long and hard about my life and my beliefs and my choices and all that. Um, and then I got to college and on a complete fluke, I took a class called uh, philosophy uh, of the med- or medieval philosophy. That's what it was. <laughs> and two things happened in that class. First, we learned all about Augustine and his philosophical underpinnings for the Catholic faith. And I realized that a lot of the same arguments that he made were also made by the people who told me that Islam was true. And yet somehow they one ended up Christian, one ended up Muslim, and they kill each other over it. So that sort of messed with my faith a lot. And I also made Mm -hmm. friends with this guy in my class who was kind of an asshole, really. He he turned out to not be that good of a person, at least back then. But um, he really nudged me towards thinking and questioning and um, he was failing the class, so I was basically his tutor. Um, I picked up on things pretty pretty easily and quickly with philosophy. I ended up double majoring in it um, because mm-hmm. of that. But um, he, I, I tutored him through that class, and we would have eight to ten hour study sessions where we were studying, but we were also talking about everything else. And he got me to admit that I was an atheist, essentially, that I was not a Muslim because... I was making arguments and he was looking at me in my headscarf and saying, you're making, you're making very deistic, if not atheistic arguments. So he got me to admit that I was no longer a Muslim, but I did go through a half-assed deist phase where I thought, oh, there must be a creator, but religion is bullshit. But then I read Richard Dawkins' uh, Blind Watchmaker and that kind of shredded that argument. Kind of very nice. needed that God of the Gaps. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, once I got introduced to that concept too, the idea that, you know, we keep shrinking God and at some point he's just going to practically disappear. He's already there, really. Um, and so, you know, I, those six months though, where I was doubting and stuff, it, I, you know, it was, it was tough. It wasn't easy. But at the end of it, you know, I was an atheist in a headscarf and I had no clue what to do because how was I going to tell my parents? I didn't even know if I was ever going to tell my parents. Um, you know, I thought maybe I could fake it till graduation, but I'm the world's worst liar. I really am. <laughs> so I, I did end up telling them and it went okay and then badly and then okay and then really badly. And though these days we're doing okay because they've had almost 10 years to get over it. Um, How long did it take you to tell them? A mm, couple of months. A big part of it was that I was kind of leading a double life. I would go out without my headscarf to go out on dates with boys from OK Cupid. Um, nice. yeah, I, I didn't know how to flirt or date or whatever. So I just, the dating site thing really worked out for me. I could just, cause everyone was on there for a reason. We all knew what we were there for. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Hey, that's where I, I met my girlfriend. That's where I met my partner. Yeah. It's just, mm-hmm. it's, it's the best. It really is. But, um, yeah. but yeah, I was sneaking off to go on dates and I wasn't wearing my headscarf on these dates, obviously. Um, and I try, was trying alcohol and pot and stuff and. <laughs> You know, I just, like I said, I'm the world's worst liar. So I ended up telling my parents that I was an atheist. And, oh, and then they they dragged me all over the state. I mean, I kind of let them, but they took me to all these different mosques, trying to get me to find someone who could, you know, quote unquote, fix me. Um, I would come home from, from school, from, from university, and there would be some person who's religious in our family just there, there to argue with me and ultimately their, their arguments all relied on faith. They're like, you just need to have faith. And I said, well, if I had been born in a Christian family, you'd be saying the same thing. And yet you think they're wrong. They said, Oh, but you're lucky you were born in the right faith. 
Mm, it's like, isn't oh, it great how all the Christians and everybody else say that about themselves? Uh, yeah. And, you know, that was ultimately the question that made me an atheist. I asked myself in a really honest way that had I not been born into Islam, would I find Islam compelling? Would I find it true and, and worth converting to? And the answer was hell no. <laughs> No way. I would have never found it. I mean, I would have found Muslims maybe to be nice people. Maybe there were parts of Islam I would have found nice. But as a whole, as a composite, no. <laughs> so <laughs> when I answered that question honestly, then that's really what made me go, okay, I'm definitely not a Muslim one. Hmm. Fucking okay. A. Yeah. So, how, so definitely consider yourself an ex-Muslim. Yep. Uh, and you definitely consider yourself an atheist. Mm-hmm. How are you bridging those together? Well, um, I, I, I've been working with ex-Muslims of North America, which is really mostly an organizing social type group right now. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, I guess for me, I don't see them as separate identities because there, I know there are ex-Muslim Christians, but to me, I feel like Islam gave me enough of the Abrahamic faiths and I'm done. I, I don't need another one. Um, and you know, out of all the faiths that are around these days, a lot of the, the more, I guess, popular or populous religions, I feel like Islam at least has this thing where it's, it's mostly internally consistent and there's not a lot of mystery. Whereas with Christianity, there's the Trinity, which nobody seems to be able to explain to me. Um, and there's people who follow the Old Testament, people who don't. With Islam, it's pretty straightforward. And if I leave a faith that straightforward, the only other option that's more straightforward is probably atheism. And so that's why I don't feel like they're being an ex-Muslim, being an atheist or that separate. Um, yeah, I, I know very, a very few ex-Muslims who are Christians and most of them are overseas. In the U.S., we tend to go atheist or some of them choose the term agnostic instead. But Yeah, it, uh, it would seem hard to go to Christian from... From Islam, yeah, you know it's it, Christianity. I I used I feel the same way about it now as I did when I was a Muslim. It just seems like some sort of easy cop out, especially Protestantism. Oh, you just accept Jesus into your heart, and bam, everything's all good. Um, we used to make fun of Christians when we were Muslim. Me and my friends we used to joke about how uh, you know they could be rapists and murderers, but they can just accept Jesus and everything's fine because. They, they sort of accepted this idea that everybody's imperfect. But what about trying to be a better person? You know, why, why isn't that important? And so, yeah, no, it did not appeal to me. Yeah. Man, so you're uh, friends with Muhammad and Sadaf? Yeah. Awesome. Any big plans coming up? Not that I know of. <laughs> I'm not really um, in, in leadership in ex-Muslims in North America. I'm really just a member with a really loud mouth and a platform. Um, it. Okay. Yeah. Um, because by the time Exclusions in North America formed, I already kind of had my own thing going okay. with, with blogging and speaking and stuff. And so, you know, I just, I didn't really have the, the resources to be uh, in the leadership, but I support it 100%, tell everybody about it when I can and uh, participate when I can. So, Awesome. Yeah, that's a, a group that uh, I am know the 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 plans are pro uh, progressing on getting groups added to more and more areas. And I'm just looking oh, yeah. forward to when they get to Boise. <laughs> if they did though, you may not know. <laughs> true. <laughs> because you're not an ex Muslim. Um, <laughs> Very yeah, true. Um, you know, they finally recently had one in my general vicinity. I won't say where or what or when, but um, I was really excited when that happened. And I mean, with traveling for conferences and stuff, sometimes I'm not even in town, but I'm just glad it's around, you know, because when I first came out as an ex-Muslim, I Googled ex-Muslim and I found a few famous people like Ayan Hirsi Ali, and I found mm. a few Christian groups overseas where they were ex-Muslims who were Christian, but nobody else. And there was the Faith Freedom Forum, Ali Sina's Forum, but that's been defunct for a long time. And mm. then there was this one blog called In the Name of Tawali that was full of kind of asshole guys. I mean, I joined, I joined their group chat. I wrote this whole piece for um, Atheist Alliance of America, their magazine. I wrote this whole piece about it. It's on Medium as well, I think, um, still. But um, they, they were really assholes when they found out that I wasn't a dude. They just, they got all weird about it. So half the guys were lecturing me about how 
you know, I should still be a virgin. And the other half of the guys wanted details about my sex life in a way that was just kind of creepy. Um, <laughs> but thankfully, you know, things have changed a lot since then. You know, we have Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, which is run by, by um, pretty, pretty egalitarian in terms of gender. And then Ex-Muslims of North America is the same thing. You know, there's as many active women as men. So it's not it's not this weird situation or uncomfortable. So that makes me happy. Awesome. So you are, uh, you are now our fourth, uh, ex Muslim we've had on the show. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. Ali and Sadov, we had back in uh, February, 2014, uh, Ellie Rizvi. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah, yeah I am. Yeah. Really badass guy. Um, yeah. had him a few months ago. Yeah. Uh, Love to talk with some more people, so we can always use the the hints and tips. Well, uh, uh, but, I, can, I can always put out a call on our secret ex-Muslim back channel and say, "Hey, who wants to who wants to talk?" Right, right, all right. Bring it on. All, all those talks, or all the all the talk of like, uh, you know, the secret meetings of of various uh, the minority the, the groups, the ex-Muslim cabal. <laughs> it actually is happening. <laughs> It's mostly, it's mostly, it's mostly us. Okay. Here for me, here's what an ex Muslim meetup is like. Somebody's going to order bacon, at least one person. Um, and laugh about it. Yes. And also eat it because it's delicious. Um, most people are going to order cocktails and be kind of silly about it. Um, we're all going to tell each other the jokes and the things that we've been thinking about for months. But uh, but yeah, no, it's it's nice having ex Muslims groups now where I feel comfortable and and welcome, and we can talk about all kinds of things and um, understand each other and and you know joke and laugh and and share war stories, you know. And I mean, we help each other out a lot with advice. Like I'd say, so many threads on our secret back channel are are advice. People saying, you know, my parents found out about this or. I want to go through with this thing and how did you guys cope with it? And um, that's actually where I feel I really shine because I've been an ex-Muslim out to my family for going on 10 years now. It'll be 10 years, like in a couple of months. So, um, you know, I've, I've been through some shit and I've been out for a long time and, you know, I have some insight to offer on that. Well, I'm, I'm really curious. Uh, and you totally don't have to answer this. Sure. Uh, th- and that's the same for all, any of the questions we ask. Uh, uh, but yeah. anyways, uh, so you totally came out to your parents as an mm-hmm. atheist about mm-hmm. 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you ever come out to them as a uh, bisexual or anything else? That, no, uh, no, 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 not officially. I was going to ask which one was harder. Um, but I'm- <laughs> no, I, I th- so, so with families like mine, unless you're engaged to be married or married, your parents don't know anything about your dating life at all. Mm. Like, you don't bring your boyfriend around or girlfriend, doesn't matter, um, until you're engaged to be married and or are, ma- are about to be married or married. So, so um, it's just a big case of being an, playing the ostrich, burying your head. Yeah, in exactly. Um, if they don't see it, they don't have to deal with it. And so me being bi was about as relevant to them as me having a boyfriend. They just didn't need to know about it. Um, okay. Yeah, so I mean, technically, they could Google me and just find everything. I'm I'm pretty out there about everything. I was just wondering because you're saying that you're the world's worst liar and all that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so. we don't talk about sex or love life stuff unless someone's like very serious and about to be married or something. Um, okay. And there are people in my family who have married outside of the religion. Um, there's a couple, Ooh. one of whom has been married for almost 20 years now. So, um, you know. It's a, I'm sure. Th- do they still say that marriage is doomed? No. Um, the person who paved the way in my family for marrying outside of the the religion and the race, she she actually. I'm really proud of the fact that she's been married so long. It really helps. It's a good argument that people use. You know that there there are people who divorce in my family who marry within the religion and the race. You know it, it happens a lot. My dad himself, his first marriage ended. My mom's his second marriage. Um, oh, wow. They weren't at the same time, so before anybody asks, um, my dad is a <laughs> as a monogamist, not a polygamist. But um, there, there's really in recent memory in my family there are only there's only one polygamist, and he didn't even live in India or Pakistan or anything. He lived in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, Whoa. he was he was my dad's um, 
he's related to my dad's family or my dad's mom's family. And he immigrated here and his, his wife who he brought with him turned out to be infertile. So he married another lady and he had the legal marriage with her and had kids with her. So that's my family in San Francisco. Oh, so yeah, but every, nobody that sounds else like my, my great, great, great grandfather. Yeah. And, and nobody else in my family in recent memory has been a polygamist. So, um, and in fact, people in my family, women will say, if my husband marries another wife, I'll divorce him on site. You know, they're not, they're not a fan. I'm more open to it than they are because <laughs> I'm polyamorous. So I'm like, sure, fine. Marry someone else. It's all good. And they're like, hell no. So yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the, the difference is, you know, power dynamics and all that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, with, with with polygyny, where one man, many women. I mean, some people choose that, but at the same time, you know, it, it has a very sexist history. Whereas, as a polyamorous person, me and my partner are multiple partners, not just my partner. So, yeah, the first one just sounds so expensive. It know. is, you know, that's why there isn't as much polygamy in the Muslim world as you would think. It's because it's expensive as hell. So unless you're poor. And can just have all crappy things or really rich enough to have multiple wives. As a Muslim man, it's not very economically feasible because you have to treat your wives exactly equal. So if you get a diamond ring, a mansion and a Mercedes for wife number one, you have to give the exact same to wife number two. Wow. Mm. Yeah. So so most of the guys are like, no, if you want a middle class life, it's not a very viable thing. Yeah. And also your children, like you end up having way more children if you have more than one wife, you know, educating and feeding and clothing and housing that many kids is very difficult. Oh, man, screw that. Yeah, I'm I'm just about a month away from getting snipped. To hell with that. Getting what? A uh, vasectomy. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. You mentioned kids. I'm like, Ugh. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I probably am going to end up wanting like to make or adopt a kid at some point, but you know, not, not that many. <laughs> and, and being polyamorous means that I'll have other adults in my life to help me and it won't just be me and my partner to, to raise a kid. So cool. <laughs> That's actually one thing I learned from my big family because I have a big family. My mom has lots of siblings and so does my dad. And at any given point, there's always more people 12, age 12 and above than younger than that. And the way our family is, we're pretty close. You know, people help each other out with their kids. So it makes it a right. easier. So free babysitting all the time. Yeah. You know, actually, we would fight over the baby. If someone has a baby, uh. they come to a family gathering. Everybody wants to hold the baby and play with the baby. And we yell at each other for being a baby hog. <laughs> And, so the new, whole, and the new mom's just like, hell yes, I get some time alone now. <laughs> yeah. So that horribly, uh, totally wrong, uh, misquoted thing from Hillary, like it takes a village yeah. to raise a kid. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It, it does help. It does help yeah. when you have lots of other people to help. Yeah, I, I saw that uh, when I was in Jordan was uh, got invited to the, the Sheikh's residence. I was there for an archaeological dig and uh, he provided some workers for us they were all his sons and nephews and mm -hmm. uh he owned the, the land he was you know the 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 figurative head of the village there was actually an elected council uh his mm -hmm. only real role was if there was a really important decision the council had to make they would come hold the meeting at his residence and let him weigh in mm -hmm. other than that he didn't really do anything but i got the the tour from the sheikh's mother of mm -hmm. the the compound and it was all of his sons building homes there. Some of his uh, younger siblings were still living in the compound. Mm -hmm. And like for his sons to be able to get married, they had to build a house first. Mm -hmm. And they all lived in the compound. And the rest of the family going out, cousins and further on out, they all lived in the, the same village, just, you know, a mile away. Mm -hmm. it, and, it really helps. Yeah. Yeah. We had uh, one worker who was not doing too well. And uh, when he overheard some talk that he might be let go, he was panicked because uh, that would have been dishonor, brought dishonor on his uncle. Yeah, that that is the flip side of it. You know, you, you worry about shaming your family. I mean, I worried about that, too, because me being an atheist and out, it's not just affecting me. It affects my entire family. You know, my mother got really, really socially ostracized and bullied about it for years. 
And I'm not proud of that. You know, I'm not happy about that. Um, but at the same time, people got over it. You know, it took a while, but, you know, they move on to the next item of gossip. You know, Hina as an atheist got old after a few years. And now they're talking about whoever else's divorces or affairs or whatever. So <laughs> that's where you have to keep that little bit of gossip or something in your back pocket for, you know, when something like that happens, you're like, yeah, I'm an atheist, but look over there. <laughs> <laughs> Man, and there are so many divorces, it's ridiculous because some of these Muslims, like, they get married young, I think, because they want to have sex and stuff. And then they realize, oh, sexual attraction, not exactly a complete basis for a married relationship for life. <laughs> what a novel concept. <laughs> if you like this show, consider giving us some financial support. We make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per episode monthly or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. $1 an episode is all we ask. Please think of the kittens. I mean, I hear about that from my ex Mormon friends too, where, you know, Mormons are encouraged to marry pretty much the second they feel super attracted to someone uh, and then, you know, as long as that person's not of the same gender, because in that case, then, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. conversion therapy for you. But um, if, you know, oh. if you're having a hetero attraction, then you're encouraged to marry that person right away. So, well, know, there's yeah. a lot of them that they'll basically set up their marriage, go on their mission and like not have any contact with that person basically for a year and then come back, bam, married. Go about their life. It's yeah. two years. Two years for a mission? My yeah. Bad. Yeah. I and understand that a, a lot of uh, Mormon missionaries find their boyfriends and first loves on their mission trips. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Man, though. I mean, Mormons and Muslims love each other. It's really weird. Um, really? Like in, in, in the U.S., there's a lot of collaboration for things like charity work. Yeah. Um, hmm. So, you know, I, I went to, remember when the tsunami happened? Like, I don't know, was that six, seven years ago? The big uh, in, in tsunami? In India or US? No, it was in, in Indonesia oh. and, and Malaysia. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. When that happened, I was already an atheist, but I went to Islamic Relief's uh, charity fundraiser because my whole family was going. And Islamic Relief is actually a really good charity. Like, they have a really high ranking and stuff like that. Um and they're not, they're not like Christian charities where they say convert for food. You know, they actually just give out, give help to people. Um, and so at the fundraiser, they mentioned that our friends at the LDS church, uh, gave us some, some supplies and everybody at the table didn't know what LDS was. So I had to explain to them that that's Mormon, <laughs> but, but not only do Mormons and Muslims get along, ex Mormons and ex Muslims get along too. Hmm. Yeah. Because there's a lot of bonding that happens there. There's a lot of similarities. And my first real atheist friend is an ex-Mormon and she and I are still really good friends, but um, she's the first person I, I really felt understood where I was coming from with how hard it was to leave my religion. Well, and those seem to be the only groups where the, the ex identification really stays. Yeah. Um, the only yeah. other one I could maybe think of is uh quiverful, um, for Christians, and then um, sometimes Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh Day Adventists will identify that way. Um, I'm I'm an ex Adventist, but it I only find it relevant if it's somebody I'm planning on having a discussion or having a debate about whether uh, Big Franks or Linkettes are better. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know what those are, then it it's irrelevant what I was. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's like Chase, uh, our former J Dub episode. Uh, you know, he really got ostracized from his family. I, mean, I feel like that's what makes you off. makes you more of an ex whatever than just an atheist. Is if if you suffered because of it um, yeah. socially, then you feel that much more. Um, and Adventists are hemorrhaging their youth so fast. Nobody's mm -hmm. going to ostracize an atheist child because if they did that, they would have no children. True. <laughs> true. I mean, you know. 
Um, uh, the other one I could think of is maybe uh, Orthodox Jew, like the really, really observant Orthodox Jews. Oh, yeah, the Hasids, yeah. Yeah, the kinds in, who are in New York and are trying to make women sit in the back of the bus because mm-hmm. we might be on our periods. Um, yeah, but that's gross. Ah, oh, gross. Blood. <laughs> Did you, you heard about that guy, right, who refused to sell tampons? No, this is awesome. Was, I want to hear. A, 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 this is a couple of weeks ago. It was a news story. I forget where it was from. It was somewhere in the U.S., um, this woman just wanted to buy some, some goddamn tampons because, you know, you As don't you get do. to, you don't get to decide. It just kind of happens sometimes. What do you do? Um, and so she went, to, she, she did what you do, which is what you go to the store and you buy some, some tampons. And this guy said he wouldn't want to ring them up for her. And he made the other employee who is a woman come and ring them up. And she asked him why, and he said, that's gross. And she said, well, what if I wanted to buy, like, bandages or gauze? Those hold blood, too. Is that gross? He said, no, that's different. Wow. Yeah. That, that's it's, obvious. It's not like she was, she was carrying a used tampon and wanting to stuff it into his mouth. These were brand new tampons in a box. Like, what is his problem? But people get weird about that stuff. I used to work it, at a drugstore, <laughs> and guys would... Guys would come through with with tampons or pads or whatever, and I'd be bringing them up, and they'd immediately say, "It's not for me; it's my girlfriend." I'm like, "I don't care who it's for. <laughs> I'm just ringing you up here. I don't give a shit." Like, <laughs> wow, I totally don't see the big deal. I mean, like, I buy them, and I don't have to make a stink about them. Yeah, it's not a big deal. Oh, and of yeah. course, there were the guys who um, I worked in kind of a, a crappy neighborhood, so the condoms were locked up and. They had to press a button to page me to to open the tampon box with my key. And uh, not the tampons, the the condoms. And uh, they'd always get weird about it. And I feel like, you know, some of them said that they needed the bigger ones, even though maybe they didn't because I was there. (laughs) That's like, I don't, I literally do not give a shit what you're doing. I'm just, this is, this is my minimum wage job. I don't care. Yeah. (laughs) Well, some guys do get awkward around the pretty girl kind of thing, but. I, yeah, I was, the whole I was in a ponytail thing. and no makeup and like a gross polo. Just I was not there to be pretty. I was there to ring up your your stuff and make you go away. <laughs> that, just, <laughs> I, I had coworkers who actually tried to make themselves look nice. Like they would put on makeup and they would try to find pants that fit. I didn't care. It was my minimum wage job that I was working when I wasn't in school. I did not give two shits. <laughs> <laughs> Although one time I did get to help this woman and she was a recent immigrant from Mexico and she didn't want to get pregnant. And so I got to teach her about condom use because I know a little bit of Spanish and she knew a little bit of English. And so we were able to communicate and I taught her about proper condom use and I'm still really proud about that. (laughs) Awesome. Hell yeah. Can I meet you halfway on the language thing? And yeah, yeah, good on you. Because most condom failures are really just people not knowing how to use them, right? Did you go to the produce section and get a banana? (laughs) No. I just told her to pinch the tip and be sure to use lube. (laughs) (laughs) All right. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wow. (laughs) And RCBS definitely did not have bananas. We had a couple of wilted heads of lettuce. I think that was it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> all right wait, wait, wait. well you had an ice cream counter you, you could have used like a drumstick or something <laughs> <laughs> that would wow okay a drumstick sized penis i wow well you know that's where when you could actually use one of the large condoms the magnums that the guys were asking for <laughs> oh my gosh all right <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm weird whatever it's all right okay Shifting gears just <laughs> just a little bit. I, I want to get your your thought on a a topic that pops up in the news every so often, and that's attempts. And it seems to be in French speaking countries uh, to ban the wearing of the hijab or niqab in certain situations. Mm. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on it as somebody who has? Uh, well, well, to be. To be clear, it, the ban is on face coverings in in um, public schools and universities and things in France. That's the specific one. Okay, it's um, only face coverings. It's it's only face coverings. Some of them also ban head coverings. It, they apply it unevenly, just like they do with any dress code. Um, but yeah, often universities will ban head scarves, and so will public schools. Um, 
Um, they claim it's it's equal because no one can wear big crosses or stars of David or yarmulkes. Um, so they think it's the same thing. I feel like it isn't because if someone told me to take off my scarf to go to school, it would be like telling me to take off my top and bra to go to school when I was Muslim. Like, it just felt like nudity to me. But um, anyway, so I, I, I have really mixed feelings on it because I understand that you know, a lot of women are forced sometimes to cover themselves. I wasn't forced and not all women are, but they are. Some of them are. I know that. But um, at the same time, I don't know if pushing them out of public spaces is really helpful because, you know, if a woman's not allowed to cover her face or head when she's out in these public spaces, a ban is just going to make her stay home. She's not going to suddenly go out without it. She's just going to stay home. And like, nobody's going to get their mind open or changed from staying at home. It just isolates them further. And so that's that's my concern with it, mm-hmm. that it's just going to isolate these people even more so than they already were for being minorities. And it's just, you know, I didn't I didn't doubt my faith or leave my faith because people yelled at me that I was a terrorist or people said that I was oppressed or whatever. Uh, it was people who honestly engaged with me and treated me like a full human being and let me participate in my public schools and in the world around me. That's what got me to really question and change my mind. Um, so I worry that things like that are sort of pushing people out to the fringes. They also are really assholes about it because I recently wrote about this, but there was this, a girl in France who wasn't wearing a headscarf. She was just wearing a long skirt, like a long peasant style skirt. Mm-hmm. And they made her go home because they said she was clearly trying to be like a Muslim or something. Whoa. Uh, okay. And so she's, she made the point that if a white girl wore a long skirt, then she she wouldn't get in trouble. But because she was known to have a Muslim family, because she wore a long skirt, they made her go home and change. And at that point, it starts really infringing on people's rights because, you know, I mean, uh, why why shouldn't she be allowed to cover her legs if she wants to? Mm-hmm. Oh, white girl in long skirt just equals hippie. That's actually she pointed that out. She pointed that exact point out that she's a hippie or a free spirit. And I'm suddenly a fundamentalist for wearing it. Um <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even read that story. That is awesome. Yeah. yeah. It just, it, it, it really pissed me off because when the bands were first being introduced, I made the argument that it's a, it's, it could be a slippery slope and how are we to determine what's religious attire and what's just somebody wanting to wear what they want to wear. And mm-hmm. uh, from a young age, I've always erred on the side of letting students express themselves because you know, someday most of us are going to end up corporate drones and we're all going to have to wear the stupid corporate drone uniform anyway. Why not let students have a little bit of room to express their feelings and their clothing? That's part of being a teenager, right? It's mm-hmm. expressing yeah. yourself through clothing, you know, all these subcultures and stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't want it to be a slippery slope, but it kind of was with this whole skirt thing that, yeah. you know, they ended up not letting a girl wear an item of clothing that anyone would wear. Man. Yeah, and if, if she'd been wearing pants covering her legs, nobody would have cared. Yeah, and, and and why should she be forced to wear one thing or another? I mean... Yeah, yeah, and the only case where any kind of bands like that I think can make any kind of justifiable sense is if you're going through security checkpoints needing to be able to show your face yeah. and have your face on ID. Yeah, but covering your head, you know, it that's not really a security concern. It can be a safety concern if you're worried about it catching on like equipment or something. Mm-hmm. But in those cases, you know, either they don't have a lot of scarf wearing women working those jobs or, you know, there's styles of headscarves that are like one smooth slick piece so it it, it doesn't dangle. Um like the kinds they have for sports or for for swimming. Hmm. And I wonder if there's any fire resistant ones. <laughs> you know that's a good question. I'm I'm gonna have to find out if that's a thing. I was and just even, thinking because I used to be a welder. <laughs> <laughs> even just loose uh, free hair would be a safety concern in those same situations. Oh, oh my god! Ro- rotating equipment. There, oh yeah. There are there are fire resistant headscarves. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> um, Google for the win. Yeah, you can get them on Alibaba. <laughs> Wait, let's see. Fire, um, fire brigades in England have them. Um, so a woman, a Muslim woman, could join a fire brigade, brigade, and they have a headscarf that is fire resistant. Hmm. And police and how awesome is that shit? 
yeah like yeah <laughs> it's nice that they have options i guess yeah um my aunt has the swimming they, they jokingly call it the burkini the burkini <laughs> but um it, it's basically a swimming outfit that covers you in sort of a, a more loose way and it has a built-in headscarf um and she has one of those and she sometimes goes swimming in them um i just didn't really swim publicly when i wore the headscarf um very much but um yeah there are options now hey yeah yeah and just letting people do what they feel comfortable doing just it doesn't seem yeah. like it should be that hard of, a, of an idea people get really hung up on it's weird and it's different and also the fact that there are women who are forced to do it but i'd imagine a woman who would go out of her way to get a burkini probably isn't being forced mm -hmm. um, probably not but you know and the ones who are being forced i would imagine would probably be not allowed out into society very often yeah they they usually or sometimes they choose not to go out as much because um they don't want to because they don't want to have to wear it a headscarf that they didn't agree to wear out in public mm. because being living in any western country and wearing a headscarf it's a it's a giant flag and people treat you as a representative of you know millions upon millions of people it's not easy being cheesy uh, something that uh, we talked about with Ali quite a bit and mm. I really enjoyed it uh, what are your thoughts about like a Muslim uh, reformation like, like kind of like the Christians had a few hundred years back um, it has to be an honest reformation that's the important part on yeah. both sides it totally you know, had to come from within yeah it has, to, it has to be more organic it has to be sincere it has to not be super left or right wing it has to really just be what would fit the Muslim community. And I feel like it's already happening to some extent. Yeah. Um, uh, plenty of Muslims are, are more flexible on their faith than you would imagine. Um, you know, most of the women in my family don't wear headscarves. A slim majority, but nonetheless is a majority. Um, no, I don't think any, for as far as I know, nobody in my family is forced to wear it. Um, even my own, my own nuclear family, like my parents and siblings, They've become a lot more, more, I mean, they're, they're still religious Muslims, no doubt, but they're a lot more flexible on things than they used to be. Mm -hmm. It just kind of happens. And I think part of that is apostasy. You know, having, having an ex-Muslim in your family changes the way that you deal with religion and the way religion affects your life. And if you look at any major reform movements in any religion, it often starts with you know, essentially per, apostates who are perceived to be radical and outside of the norm, they get the ball rolling. And then the people in the religion realize that they don't want to lose members. And so they change things in the hopes that people will stay. Yeah. Well, and if you look at the, the Christian Reformation, uh, that was a horribly bloody process. Yes, it was. Because up to that point... As long as you kept quiet in yourself, you could believe and do whatever the hell you wanted. Uh, most mm -hmm. of the, the people in rural Europe were, were still basically pagan. Uh, and why wouldn't they be? Their priests didn't even speak their language. Mm -hmm. And their services weren't in their language. And mm -hmm. they, so it then started the, the process of the Inquisition, and Protestants did the same thing with going through and trying to force all of the pagans to actually convert to Christianity and you all had to convert to the right kind for whatever your particular prince uh, decided was right. It took hundreds of, hundreds of years after that for it to actually liberalize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously a fan of this idea of reform. And, um, you know, some people don't like it. They, they like the idea instead of trying to deconvert everybody um, or convert them to another religion or something. And to me, that's not realistic because there are people who really identify with their religion. And if we can make that religion less harmful, then and encourage more free thinking, we're going to have more people leaving the religion, but we're also going to have the religion itself being less harmful. And to me, that's my priority always with, with when it comes to anything. It's trying to reduce the amount of harm that's being done. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, and especially with the the fact that Islam is supposed to be passing up Christianity as the world's largest religion by 2070. That, that, that's mostly due to reproductive rates, really. But <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, in, in those numbers, they would count me as a Muslim because I've come from a Muslim family. 
they don't exactly go to every single person they're counting and say, hey, are you still a Muslim? Hmm. That's pretty much the same with the Mormons, too, though. It's true. Basically, you're, it takes, you're it takes a lot life. to be uh, excommunicated. It does. Uh, my fiance is technically Mormon because her grandfather was a bishop and mm-hmm. had her named in a Mormon church as a baby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she never once attended a Mormon service. She never went through, you know, never got baptized, but she was named. So she's on the books for 110 years. <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend who is, is a lesbian, a trans lesbian. Okay. And she's still technically a male Mormon in their books. Sure. You know, it's really hard to get excommunicated. You'd think she, of all people, would be excommunicated. But no. Mm-hmm. It's not even the easiest to get them to, to drop you. I've got a yeah. few friends that have done it, but it takes some work. Yeah, you have to write letters and, and yell about it for a while or do something that really pisses them off. Well, and But they... Even after writing the letters, you still have to meet with the local bishop and get him to sign off on, on you losing your membership. Mm-hmm. They don't just accept you, resignations. Yeah. That's when you say, I break with thee, I break with thee, I break with thee. Then you kick dog poopy on their shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Although what's kind of funny is for me to get out of the Adventist church, I had to write a letter to the, the church that held my membership and they had to take it up for a vote. <laughs> wait, wait. So you wanted to leave it, but they had to vote on it. Yes, uh, all membership. That's ridiculous. De- all membership decisions have to be decided by the local church in a business meeting, and so they had a business meeting coming up the next month, and so they took my request to resign my membership to the committee or to the to the the church body in that meeting, and a motion was was made, seconded, and passed to remove my membership. I love that your church had a business meeting. Yep. <laughs> it's, that's the most ridiculous thing. Like, why can't you just say, I am not a member anymore? Like, th- at that point, I feel like you're not a member anymore because you don't want to be a member anymore. But they had to sit and decide. It's just, yeah. wow. You know what? If you stop going, you're not a member anymore. Yeah. Oh, only once they decide to finally clean you off the books. And it takes a long time for it to be done disadvantageous to have your numbers off yeah um, then they they keep on coming around yeah it's kind of, kind of like you know pyramid marketing scheme yeah. sell, selling and like you uh, keep getting the magazines in the mail uh, for me yeah, the most annoying crazy. one was addressing me as pastor dustin williams were, yeah. <laughs> were you ever a pastor almost oh, i was okay. a, so i was a that's... seminary student uh working on my master of divinity and yeah, so I wasn't ever a pastor, but I actually quit in the middle of preaching an evangelistic series in Mexico. And one of the sponsoring organizations, because of that, signed me up for their magazine. And they put me in because I was preaching for them. They put me in as Pastor Dustin Williams. And I moved <laughs> twice and I was still getting those. Wow, they, they managed <laughs> to find you, huh? Oh, Yeah. <laughs> Religions are really good at keeping track of people's mailing address. That's true. I hope the Scientologists hey. don't find me here because I went to their place for a joke and I put <laughs> in my address like a genius. And now I just, they send me stuff. Oh, you know who else sends me stuff? American Jewish University. And that's because I went to what was supposed to be a debate between two rabbis and Hitchens and Harris. When nice. Hitchens was still alive. Uh-huh. Yeah, it was. It didn't end up being a debate. It was really just a discussion because the rabbis were pretty chill. Um, yeah, I saw that but, on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was there for that. It was nice. I'm really glad that I went because, uh, you know, it was one of the last times Hitchens made a public appearance before he passed away. Because I went to that event, they keep sending me stuff in the mail. And I'm not actually interested in, in American Jewish University stuff, but whatever. But you're, you're being bought off by the Zionist, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so you mu- they must want to just send you to school there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, like I need more school. I have a bachelor's and that hasn't done me too much good. So, <laughs> Oh, man. Quick, what's your thoughts on Jews for Jesus? It's weird. It will never <laughs> not be weird. Okay, good. Uh, what's, oh. your, what's your trade? What do you do? 
Well, up until last Friday, um, I worked at a web development company doing content and training and technical writing, but I got laid off slash downsized um, mm-hmm. on Friday. So as of right now, I am on severance pay and hopefully soon on employment. <laughs> um, uh- I have a few leads, thankfully, and um, I'm just going to hustle harder with the writing gigs because I have had some paid writing gigs. So um, I'm just going to work harder on that and also possibly set up a Patreon and see if that helps. So okay. I should nice. be OK. All right. you, you think uh, Jews for Jesus is weird? The uh, There's something even weirder I've heard of, and that's Seventh Day Muslims. What? I have never heard what? of Seven really? Day Muslims. I've heard of Seven Day Adventists. Yes, this is Muslims converted into to Adventists who still consider themselves Muslims, even though they are Seventh Day Adventists. Well, the dietary restrictions oh are basically God. the same, right? Yeah. No, they aren't. Are they? Very similar. Uh, when I was in, in Britain on the International Air Cadet Exchange. Oh, my the, God. I, I I found an article about this guy. Okay, I just I just typed in Muslim Seventh Day Adventist, former Muslim religion teacher, now a deacon at the Cornerstone Seventh Day Adventist Church. Uh, Abbas believes that all Adventists are Muslims because being a Muslim means being submitted to God. And when you are Muslim and learn of Seventh Day Adventist faith, you have no choice except to become an Adventist. That yep. is amazing. That's no. the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard. The place where I've heard about this the most, actually where I just heard about it, period, was in a Muslim-majority area in China where some Adventist missionaries were operating illegally. And not only would that have gotten the missionary in trouble if they started changing their identity too much, but it there it's illegal to convert so becoming a Christian would have not only gotten them killed, but in trouble with the law. Damn. Yeah. That's uh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I th- we're, we're starting to get uh, down on time a bit. Um, mm-hmm. You want to plug all your, your internet stuff? All right. I blog at the Free Thought Blogs Network under the name Heinous Dealings. That's freethoughtblogs.com slash heinous. <laughs> um other than that you know I, I i post all my speaking gigs there so if you ever want to hear me bullshit in person you can you can find it right there um i don't have much coming up right now but i have a few things in the works and my book comes out in december uh mm. it's a skeptic's guide to islam through uh pitchstone publishing which is pretty great kurt's pretty great um and so that's going on and then I'll probably be starting a Patreon soon, so that'll be good. And uh, because I'm unemployed, I'm planning on blogging even more. So, um, yeah, that should be fun. Awesome. awesome. Are you on the Twitters? Oh, yes. Uh, Heinous Dealings is my Twitter handle. And uh, you can find me on Facebook under my real, true, full name, Hina Databoy. There's a link on my uh, on my profile on uh, Free Thought Blogs on the left in my bio. So. Yeah, I'm not hard to find at all. You can Google just my first name, H E I N A, and you find me. So <laughs> yep. awesome. Where did the and, uh, yeah, come from? We'll have to get you back on uh, when your book comes out. Yeah, no, definitely. I'd love to talk about that when that happens. And just keep in mind, you have more time to work on your book now. Uh, yes, you know what? Actually, I, I'm really excited about that. I've been kind of doing chores yesterday and today, but. Uh, I'll have writing time. I'm really excited. Sweet. Well, fucking A, this has been a lot, a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, what? I said fucking A, this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, it really has been. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming on. It was my pleasure. And for all of our listeners, thanks for listening, and we'll, we'll be back at you next week with news. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads.